with your with your progress. Okay. So good question. So we've got four types of, 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 of helixes. We've got straight angle, just meaning one solid angle. Okay. We've got fully progressive, which means you start with one angle, you finish with another angle, and it's just progressively shifting between those two angles for the whole curve. You've got a multi-angle, which is based on basically what he just asked. And then you've got an inverse progressive, which we'll talk about that here in just a second. So straight angles. Pretty simple. You start at the beginning of the helix, at the tip of the helix, you start with one with one angle and it just maintains that angle all the way through. Pretty flat shift curve. Drag race guys like them. Um, some turbo guys like them. Uh, there's various scenarios where, where straight angle helixes really work good in the, in the, in the, the characteristics that are listed there. Um, fast upshift, good for a short drag race. Um, you can kind of focus more on tuning your primary if you use a straight angle. Okay. Um, multi-angles. There's a couple different types of multi-angles. A full progressive, we just talked about a full progressive. Uh, let's say you've got a 4440. So it starts out in a 44. You stab the throttle. It goes to a 43, 42, 41, and it stops at a 40. Now here's the tricky part with progressive helixes. You're basically never in the 44, and you're never in the 40, because it starts in the 44. But how long are you actually at a standstill? A tenth of a second. Now, as soon as it starts to shift, you're at a 43 and three quarter, and you see what I'm saying? So anytime you're trying to tune a progressive helix, you really need to think about the middle angles, not the start angle and the finish angle, because you're really not spending any time there, okay? Uh, same with the finish angle. If you're drag racing, in, in my drag, I've got an F7 drag sled, and I, and I ended up um, with, a, with a full progressive, but I never get to the 40 degree. And, it, and I knew I was having a hard time pulling peak RPM. It was wanting to drop RPM at the end of the track. I was having a hard time pulling the 40. Well, it wasn't the 40 I was having a hard time pulling. It was actually the 41, if that makes sense. Okay, so you got to keep that in mind when you're turning a full progressive. Uh, partial progressive, or we, a lot of times we call them a mountain helix. What it's going to do is it's going to start in one angle right here, and it's going to hold that angle for a certain distance. This distance right here, that says 0.460. 0 0.460 is basically a half inch. 0 0.50 would be a half inch. So it's going to hold that given angle for a half inch. And then it's going to shift to another angle right here, all the way to the tip right there. So that's your multi-angle helix. So let's say it's a 7357. It's going to hold the 73. Whoops. It's going to hold the 73 from here to here. Then it's going to radius cut or radius shift very quickly to a 57, but it's a straight angle after that. It's going to hold the straight angle after that. A lot of mountain guys use these, and the reason being is because you can make most of the helix have really good back shift with a straight angle. If you think about it, when you're back shifting, that helix, that roller has got to come backwards in the angle. So if that angle is, is becoming larger when you're shifting back, it's going to have a hard time. It's basically going up a set of stairs. It's trying to, it's trying to back shift up into a higher angle. But if you turn that into a flat angle, it's, it's, a, it's a straight rate. So it's just going to maintain the same rate as, as back shift until it hits that big number right there. So that's a, that's a really critical piece of information if you're trying to figure out how to change your helix to meet the conditions that you're riding in, whether it's drag racing, hill climbing, you know, back, you know, back east, these guys that do trail riding, whatever it is, that gives you an idea to try to figure out what's going on and what you need to adjust, okay? So uh, partial progressive or multi-angle as we're gonna call it. That's what mo the industry refers to it as. Okay, inverse progressive. We talked about a 4440 with the progressive. Inverse progressive would be a 4044. And this is a big deal with turbo guys because they don't make a lot of power, so they kind of need an angle to get that boost going, a shallow angle. But as soon as they get boost, you got all this power really fast, and you kind of need to settle it down a little bit, so they actually use a bigger angle. 
to do that. So that's where a lot of people use inverse progressive helixes. Another example is a lot of the UTVs, like the Polaris Razors, they're coming from the factory with an inverse uh, an inverse progressive and the reason being is because what happens is the rolling resistance from a standstill is somewhat lower than the rolling resistance at 70 miles an hour. Once you get the thing going it's easier to maintain it. So an inverse progressive keeps them from hitting the rev limiter. Um, a, a lot of the clutching we're doing on razors, we're going away from an inverse progressive because we're loading, we're changing it with spring, pressure and cam arm in the primary. We're carrying the shift out further in the tip. So we're going, the inverse progressives, they're a little bit, like if you hit sand where your load doesn't necessarily drop as you shift out, an inverse progressive does not back shift very well at all, okay? Any questions on that? Okay. All right, effects of, dri of driven spring. The biggest thing I want you to remember with driven spring on a secondary, side pressure and heat. That's, that's, the, that's pretty much what it comes down to. That's the simplest way to, to explain it. It is possible to be too stiff on it and to have too much side pressure. What will happen then is, is the machine will get real revvy, but it won't go fast. You'll sound like you're going fast, but you're just not doing anything. Um, so there's, there is a happy medium there. You can either A, go to a little bit li larger, a steeper helix, or you can back off on your spring pressure. So that's where you've, you've got to weigh you know, how fast the machine will upshift and still maintain a cold belt temperature. Secondary springs are just like a primary spring. You've got an initial rate and you've got a final rate and, and the, everything in between. So it's possible to it's possible to get good belt side pressure at engagement, but lose it by the time you get to full shift out. And you'll start to have clutch heat by the time you do get to full shift out. So let's say you've got a, a 240, 340 spring. Uh, you can go to a 260, 340 spring or a 280, 340 spring. You're not changing the 340, you're just changing the initial rate. And we talked about how that correlates before. The other, the other thing I want to talk about on secondary spring is obviously the quicker, the stiffer the spring, the faster that thing's going to back shift. So hill climb guys, uh, rimshaw guys, what they want is they want super, super stiff springs. So when they go over a catwalk or slide into a corner or, or whatever they're doing and they back off, the, as fast as they get right back on it, that RPM comes right back to peak. That, that's costing them time on their run, their timed run. The problem with really stiff springs is it typically wears parts out faster. So these guys that are racing, they're not necessarily carried about that because they're going, you know, they're rebuilding clutches or whatever. The other thing is sometimes stiff springs create belt heat because you're actually creating so much bite on the belt that it's, it's, it's pinching the belt too hard. That's, that's less, that happens less often, but it does happen, okay? All right, let's talk about belt design for a little bit. There's a lot of misconceptions about belts, so we'll, tr we'll talk about this. Uh, there's several, several different types. The, the, the defining factors are what, if it's a top cog or a smooth top cog or a bottom cog. Pretty much nowadays, you see top cogs. The reason, you, know, you understand what I'm talking about, top cog. If you, if you look around the outside of the belt and there's, you know, there's, it's wavy, that's the top cog. The reason they do that is because it moves more air and it cools better. You're dispersing the air, just like fins on an air-cooled motorcycle, same idea. You're, you're letting the heat come away from the belt and then the air pulls the heat with it, okay? It wasn't that long ago that you didn't see a lot of top cog belts, maybe, you know, 2000. You know, back when the Articat 800s and the Skidoo 800s, and you know, they they weren't quite making the heat, but also the technology wasn't there as far as belts either. Uh, belt material, what the belt's made out of. I, I get this comment all the time. Well, I don't want to keep having to buy $200 belts. Well, the reason it's a $200 belt is because it's got Kevlar in it. The $90 belts don't have Kevlar in them. That's pretty much the defining factor on belt price is Kevlar. Kevlar is super strong, it resists heat, it doesn't break down, where a non-Kevlar belt is, is pretty much, I mean it's just like tires and tire wear and how they hold up and how they handle heat. So most of the belts we see nowadays are a Kevlar design, they have a Kevlar cord inside them. And then the manufacturer, this is where the misconceptions come in. All belts are not created equally and they're not the same dimension. 
If you go down to your dealer and you buy a brand new belt for a Skidoo 800 XP, and, and you blow it up and then you go decide to buy a Gates or a Carlisle and they say this is the direct replacement belt, I guarantee you it is not the same dimension, it is not the same composition. And it will probably run differently. You'll probably see either an RPM increase or an RK, RPM decrease. And what they're doing there is they're manufacturing the belt to their specifications, where the OEM has their own specifications. Uh, Polaris. We talked about um, that gap between the belt and the side of the clutch. When you start your sled and it idles, if it's gripping the belt, it's going to try to take off at a start or it's going to creep, right? Versus if there's enough gap there, just let there and sit it spin until you give it the throttle, it'll take off. That's what we call belt to sheave clearance. If you go from a Polaris belt to say a Carlisle belt, that belt to sheave clearance is going to be different and it's going to affect your performance. So anytime you change manufacturer of belt, you, ha you have to reshim. There's really, there's pretty much no way around it. It's, it's, it's almost always different. The only time that that doesn't change, or the time that that rule doesn't apply is skidoo. You can't reshim a skidoo clutch. So you, you really can't adjust that tolerance on a skidoo primary clutch. Um, the other thing is um, durometer or the hardness of the belt. Um, actually, let me back up. There is a way to shim a skidoo clutch, but it's tricky and most people don't do it. Uh, most people don't know how to do it. So, it, and it affects the balance of the clutch. Um, okay, uh, durometer, belt durometer, rubber durometer, the harder versus the softer. Softer belts typically get better squeeze, just like a softer tire on ice. But they wear quicker, or brake pads or anything else that wears. The softer you get, the quicker, the, you know, the better traction you're going to get on the wear surface, but you're going to reduce. Uh, lifetime, you know, the, the, the lifetime of the item. Um, harder belts typically get less traction on the sheath. So one of, a comment I'll get was, well, I was running such and such OEM belt and I switched to this aftermarket because it wears so much longer, it's more durable, I get more miles out of it. Well, there could be two reasons for that. One, it, be, it could be simply because it's a harder composition. Or two, it could be because your clutch calibration was more apt for that belt design. And it may have nothing to do with actual durometer of the belt. And that's one of the things that I find a lot of guys don't understand. They'll actually tune their clutch performance based off of what belt they're using. So cat guys, I had M1000 guys that were having a hard time pulling RPM and they would go from the 046 belt to the 040 belt, or the 060 belt. Because the O, I always get this backwards, one of those belts is harder than the other so it would get a little more slip and the RPM would go up. Uh, okay, troubleshooting, couple things, poor performance. This goes back to what we just talked about. Typically poor performance is because there's a, war, a wear item that's simply worn out. Now, if you buy a used machine and you're getting poor performance from the, the get-go, I'm not going to even try to help you tune it. Because the first thing you need to do is go through the clutches, have them rebuilt, and make sure that they're set up properly. You could tune till, uh, till you're out of daylight, and it's not going to matter if you're chasing a bad roller or, or a wore out spring. So the first thing to always do, make sure everything's in proper working order. Um, over revving, high RPM. We kind of already talked about a number of scenarios that are going to cause that. Changing a belt, spring pressure too high, um, weights too, le too light, helix angle too low, or secondary spring pressure too high. All those things are going to cause over revving or your peak RPM to be too high. Uh, the other thing, elevation change. We haven't really talked about that. Remember, we're tuning for conditions, whether it's heavy snow, light snow, Long track, short track, heavy rider, light rider, high elevation, low elevation, um, 500 foot drag race versus 1200 foot mountain climb. Those are all different conditions that have to be tuned to. And you can go set a sled up to run 500 foot drags and it's going to hit peak RPM and then you take it to the mountain and it's going to be low on RPM. That's because you were running down a hard packed track with no load versus going to three and a half foot of powder where it's very, very heavy load. So again, over revving or under revving, it's very condition sensitive as well as, or, or I should say it's condition sensitive, but you've got to calibrate for that, that condition. Um, alignment and belt tension. 
Um, two big things that affect durability uh, and performance. We'll start with alignment. Primary clutch versus secondary clutch. There's two, there's three dimensions that have to be maintained. You've got the primary clutch in alignment with the secondary clutch. You've got the primary clutch twisted or the secondary clutch twisted versus one another. And then you've got offset. So if you're running a, a chassis with a jack shaft, all 